Thanks very much for that um, whirlwind tour, um, not just of financial market crisis, but um, as advertised before Andrew spoke, of the very fundamental ideas, concepts that underlie them, and how they can radically shift, and how we must begin to think in radical directions if we're to deal with this god-awful mess, right, which is the global financial system, and see its transition into a brave new world, right? So I'm going to start off the Q&A here. There must be lots of questions. We have another half an hour at most. Um, so I'd like to take questions from the floor. Um, uh, as, as, as chair, I have prerogative of asking one question first, and I'll ask it, and then, gentlemen, I'm sure that the burning question in everyone's mind, um, as attractive as Andrew's bright new future for Asian finance uh, is, we have the legacy of the old, the old financial system and its horrible debt dynamics. And there was Anup's question first, which was before a Midsummer's Night Dream can begin its run, uh, King Lear has to end, right? The Act 3, Scene 3 has to, has to come on. And, and what is Act 3, Scene 3? So this is my first question. I'll clear this out first so that we can talk about the future. So are we going to end, does it end with a whimper or a bang? Does it end back in Asia in crisis? And the crisis this time will, of course, if it is, if it is going to be systemic, if it is going to be debt deflationary, which you suggested very strongly it could be, if it's going to be a debt deflationary ending, um, will it involve China? Are we seeing the first signs of that? And that's the question in everyone's minds. Um, you know, is this fall in oil prices? We are seeing the beginning of Irving Fisher's point number six, right? We get to we get to another global depression, or does it end differently? Because China is different. Yeah, I think you know you're really asking the sixty-four dollar trillion dollar question, right? You know, nowadays everything is in trillions. Um, you know, because presidential candidates are now billionaires, you know, so it's a, it's a trillion dollar question. The issue here is this, I think we need to look at development increasingly from a biological evolutionary context, rather than this very simplistic, let's assume we have perfect information, let's assume that, you know, the, the system is mechanical. The fundamental problem of economics is that mainstream neoclassical economics is Newtonian, whereas the real world of finance is actually quantum. So, it's, so linear projections are by definition wrong. Linear projections are a useful <coughs> approximation, but because everything is a feedback, uh, it, you know, we, 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 need to, we need to understand this. So for example, anybody who says you know, China will kill over suddenly forgot that uh, you know, this is what the Germans call schadenfreude, you know, their own markets have dropped 15, 20%, you know. So it's actually everything's feedback mechanism interrelated. In fact, we used to, finance, basic finance theory said that you buy, you know, uh, diversification is investing in an asset that is negatively correlated with your main uh, uh, assets. Troubles is everything is now highly correlated with each other. You have nowhere to hide, okay? The Chinese economy is actually slightly neg negative correlated because the governance system is very different. And so the options for making decisions are much more uh, dispersed and wide. And so you know, don't, don't assume that, that, that they will go in the linear type way. Will uh, we get into this crisis? Well, um, when you talk about cycles, the reason why you get into cycles is because the dynamics in the system forces people who know that the cycle is happening somehow make it happen. This is Shakespearean, right? You know, uh, 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 you know, people, people get on the stage, they don't know when to get off, and un unfortunately something happens. Okay. The question with the uh, answer is, is it dis deterministic? Can man change his fate, right? Because if you believe fully in this cycle, you know, your fate is predetermined. That's not true. 
We can change because technology is changing, right? Knowledge is changing. So the game is very complex now. Let me, let me put it this way. The game is very complex. And the game is very complex because nobody dreamt that a handful of people who are determined through terrorists or whatever can change the game. Okay? You know, 9-11 changed the world. Right? Uh, you know, the emergence of Ebola, the emergence of the new, uh, um, you know, if uncontrolled, can change the whole health dynamics. Right? These are issues that we never dreamt about because the world was cut off. You know, we only began to understand what was the meaning of typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary was a, was a woman who had typhoid, but she herself was not affected. But everywhere she went, she spread it. And in the same way today, we are seeing, you know, a, a, a virus. So the traditional uh, surgical disruption of these diseases actually disperse the virus or the germ elsewhere, and then the system gets infected. Okay, so we, we're now, you know, we're, we're now in a very difficult uh, environment. So more specifically, so Andrew, how... I, no, no, but I'm just trying to get back to the answer. Okay. The answer is this, you know, you, I am saying that if anybody can get out of this crisis, Asia can. Because Asia is a net, not a net borrower. I would be very pessimistic if we are net borrowers, that our fate is dependent upon the, those people who lend money on us. Hello, we are net savers. We are lending to the rest of the world, right? How come we can't use, how come we, tr we don't trust our own people, our youth, by investing in them? Okay? So, so, so you know, I, I mean, you know, let, let me put a very simple common sense. <coughs> Actually, if you think about the, 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 the four trillion stimulus package the, 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 of the Chinese in, 19, in 2008, 2009, the most successful part of that package actually was the helicopter money that was given to the rural poor. Because what happened with the rural poor was that the rural poor immediately took the money, spent it, and stimulated all the excess uh, buying domestic consumption mm -hmm. that revived some of the domestic industries. Okay. Now, of course, the uh, the lending, the allowing the state-owned enterprises to build huge ghost towns and uh, in good infrastructure, bad infrastructure, ended up with this huge uh, credit spurge, and that has all its side effects. So, you know, my view is that Asia has the technology, has the wisdom to be able to avoid this trap. If it does not avoid this trap, there is something in the politics of bureaucracy, political dynamics, which I personally don't understand. That's not my specialty. Okay, so more specifically, the, instead of Asia, let's focus on China, because that's the epicenter of it right now. That's the epicenter of this debt overhang, that's the epicenter of this investment bust. Uh, that is where, if at all, this um, Richard Ku story of the balance sheet, you know, on the corporate side may be replayed. That's where, if at all, uh, the banks may founder Right, because the debt is, is seated squarely in the banks, and uh, that is where, if sufficient reflation of one form or another, policy innovation one form or another, cannot be executed by central government for one reason or another, the system then moves into, in, into a Japanese-style debt deflation, right? That, that, that Irving Fisher's cycle is, well, do, you, do you think that's likely, yeah, no, or, or I, how, 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 what is the institutional difference in China that prevents this story from being No, the, the problem with the Japanese, if I may, uh, the, how they got into this trap was for some unknown reason, Japanese uh, uh, decision-making is consensus. And in fact, you know, uh, it goes through very different reiterations of decision-making. And it was more a decision trap uh, rather than a capability trap. Uh, this is my humble view. I'm not a Japanese expert, but uh, I have observed the Japanese uh, uh, issues and I, I came to that. Uh, in fact, the Japanese have been saying that uh, some major decision uh, changes were externally brought in. You know, the arrival of the black ship, the, uh, the MacArthur regime uh, after the Second World War transformed Japanese society uh, and put, set them off onto a virtuous growth path, but they Demographic aging is creating certain problems. The Chinese are very different. The Chinese actually 
are not theoreticians. The Chinese are very pragmatic uh, people who actually don't believe in theory uh, uh, and are actually much more, you know, much less ideological from a practical point of view. And, you know, they learn, adapt, and actually uh, uh, advance from their mistakes. So uh, I think what will happen, my view is that the, the macro conditions are actually not bad. The government is not in huge fiscal debt situation. The, if you, I did a study on the national balance sheet of China, which has been first published 2011, and the latest numbers are 2013. Basically, the central government and the local governments have net uh, net assets, net of all liabilities, including domestic liabilities, roughly 130% of GDP. The American equivalent is that the, fed the American federal government owes the rest of the world about 24% 20 of GDP, and the local government has no debt, I mean, has debt, but it owes the mostly pension funds, etc. So to a large extent, the Chinese government, the fiscal space and the monetary space allows it to do the rewriting of the balance sheet. Okay, and it, they can do it in a way which would take a lot of uh, political decision making, very tough decisions, but it's a left hand dealing with the right hand because I don't have to consult a foreigner to do this, right? It's just a matter of saying, okay, you know, state owned enterprise A, I close you down, I use the money to pay off the, 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 the bank, which is state owned anyway, uh, etc. So, you know, a lot of the options are possible mm. and it's not as gloom and doom as people pay it out to be. Okay, that's very reassuring to hear, uh, thankfully, for, for, for our, our finances. So, hopefully, Andrew has answered the essence of that problem. If you've got further questions on that, please feel free to ask. Um, so, I'll take the first question from the floor, please. Okay, sir. Can you identify yourself, please, Hi, and uh, keep long. the question short? Thank I'm you. not an economist, but uh, I was just wondering, in light of uh, yes, enlightening what you spoke about, but I was just wondering whether in looking for a new um, so-called game plan for the economy, what do you think of Gandhi's uh, statement that we should live simply so that others can simply live? Because I speak in light that I think maybe the 2008 crisis was partly caused by greed, greed of bankers as well as greed of people to own more than they should actually own. So I think what Gandhi says is sensible. And the other thing about Asia is I think it's just translating out of communism, authoritarianism. So if you're going to ask China to put this $4 billion and just spend it, I don't know whether they'll like give it all to their friends, which doesn't really solve the problem and there'll still be a lot of unemployed, uneducated kids around. And I think that has a place because it probably gives security to people like pension funds who um, take very little risk. And in the light of my repeating what Gandhi did say, that we should live simply so that others can sim simply live. Um, yeah. Um, we also have liabilities like the environment and health. I think it's not cheap to house many people in Europe uh, from Syria and other war-torn countries, partly maybe could blame oil and all that, as well as health. I mean, how much are we spending on health care? on preventable chronic diseases that, I mean, it's just burning a budget for no reason. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take another question. My name is Sunny. I'm just a retail investor. Okay. My question is that you didn't even touch, not even in passing, how to protect the system that you just told us all about. But the financial crisis, I think we learned something from there. You find and find them $150 billion on the bankers and all that. And lately, it's a $5 billion uh, on the on the what Goldman Sachs and the, the, the Icelandic people, the Nordics, they think differently. They put the central bankers or other bankers in jail. In Singapore, they've got they've got the Rotan or the Kane, which is very barbaric. Would that solve the problem? But all the system you you, you talk about us, you did a few people just a few years back. They 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 they, they caused a great financial crisis, not a the the recession, the great recession. So all the system you told us about, fantastic. But a few people can just destroy the whole thing. So you must have a protective system, security. What is the security system to protect your, your system? Thank you, Sunny. And, and young man? What, Hi, what I'm Weijie. I'm a member of the public. So I've got two questions. Firstly, um, you talk about building the equity, equity market. So for example, uh, Singapore, how do you restore confidence in 
Singapore stock market, given people have such low interest in it. And second, you talk about fintech and how it has the potential to change the banking environment. So let's say specifically the asset management. So with the internet, it has uh, brought a lot of information available to the masses. So do you think um, individuals are able to perform their, and make their own investment decisions and thus narrow the gap between professional investment advisors and retail players? Good, good question, Wichit. Uh, since, since you're standing up, we'll take you as a last question, huh? sir. Mr. Andrushan, uh, thank you for your talk tonight. I really appreciate reading your articles. Very informative and very in-depth on China. My question here is that the shadow banking in China is a big uncertainty. Since you are so well versed in China, can you share with us, is it going to be problematic? And then on the other hand, the current today Chinese are different from the Chinese of our parents. Because our parents think forward, think 10 years, 100 years, you know. The current Chinese, they only think 10 years. So this is a certain mindset change already. Good question. Thank you very much that, for that, sir. Okay, Andrew, would you like to take it? Uh, in, wonderful which, question. Whichever order, wonderful you, question. <laughs> whichever um, order you'd like. I really please. appreciate the Gandhi <coughs> question because it brings back morality, philosophy, you know, into the game. And I'm a great admirer of Gandhi, but as you know, his successors didn't follow Gandhi's road, okay? Uh, or, or, or rather, they lurched between the Gandhian care for the rural masses and the need to modernize, <coughs> right? Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, I spent uh, 10 days in India, South India actually, uh, mostly Kerala. And I, during that period, I read a lot of books on India. I've been going to India twice a year, every year for the last, uh, since, you know, the, the, well, since around 2000. Uh, and uh, um, I was the one who made a bet that, uh, you know, India's growth rate will overtake the Chinese. And I think I've, 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 I've been proven right, and it yeah. has, right? Yeah. Because demographically, it's right. Gandhi, you know, uh, the, the difference between the, 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 the Indian leaders and the Chinese leaders, uh, uh, I'm going to make a very uh, in politically incorrect statement. India has lots of saints and sadhus. You don't find them in China, right? Uh, that means, you know, Indian uh, philosophers and, and thinkers and meditators give them deep insight. It's part of their culture. And Gandhi is representative of that. And, you know, Gandhi is, uh, 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 you know, was, you know, cared about the, the rural areas, but the modern mindset is about modernization, development in the cities. So, China is urbanizing very fast and concentrating its knowledge and culture in city culture. And India today still remains fundamentally fairly, you know, uh, less urban, significantly less urbanized. It is a very, very different path. And so I think India's, you know, uh, un particularly under Modi, is now swinging into uh, 21st century type of thinking, uh, less Gandhian. But even Nehru, uh, who succeeded Gandhi, uh, 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 said, uh, you know, Gandhi is a saint and very poor. I paraphrase, I can't remember the exact word, but it costs a lot to keep him poor. Uh, because, you know, it costs a lot to, to safeguard uh, him as a saint, and even as you know, Gandhi was assassinated. But Gandhi raised a very fundamental point, which is that how do we keep greed in check in the system? because there is no end to greed. And that philosophical question has not been answered by this crisis because some of the greediest guys never went to jail. Right? This is a crisis which probably something like three trillion dollars was spent in rescuing them from the crisis and it still has not ended because the QE has not been with, gone back to normality and the culprits have not gone to jail. So they've been fined a lot of money. I mean, there's a, there's a 
chart that I didn't want to show, which uh, I, 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 it is in my other talk, so if you go to my website, you can get the other talk, what we learned and have a lot learned from this. Uh, and if you give me your email, I'll send it to you. Uh, basically said, you know, the banks have been fined $200 billion with another $65 billion to go, which is roughly $300 billion. But on the other hand, the central banks subsidize them through QE, the equivalent of $300 billion. So on one hand, you subsidize them, on the other hand, you tax them away through the fine. So it, you know, it's this problem that hasn't been solved. Now, the gentleman who is an investor asks, what is the system to protect the system? Well, you know, you can't completely protect the system because the United States uh, has not protected its own investors as well as you thought they would have protected because they didn't put anybody in jail, right? And a lot of this uh, investor protection issues, which the US is the leading thinker on this, has not been solved. And if the number one, the most advanced, sophisticated market hasn't solved this, uh, not going to be easy for us to solve this because we are now interconnected markets. You know, we can buy US stocks anytime, we can buy derivatives anytime. Uh, what is to protect one from one's own greed and, I'm sorry, stupidity? Answer is the state can protect you up to a point, but it is your money, you make the decision. Now, if somebody cheated you to do this, the state has a role. But in today's transparency and disclosure, you can disclose everything you like, but in most retail investors, what I buy depends on what my friend tells me to buy. You know, I used to say in Hong Kong that if the amate, you know, the, ma the housemaid, uh, starts buying stocks, it's the sign of a bubble, <laughs> right? Uh, I used to say that when somebody asks somebody, invest in number 23456, which is a stock code, you're in trouble because he or she doesn't know what stock number 2356 means. It's just a number. I just buy like I buy a four-digit thing. And whether the stock makes money, doesn't make money, it's got cash flow, good governance, they don't care. Wins, I'm very happy. Lose, you know, I get very sad. So protecting investors is still a problem that we as securities regulators haven't solved very well. To do more education, that's fine. But, uh, and to put some people in jail, that's necessary. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophical and a practical problem that we haven't solved. Uh, and I think that answers both question two and question uh, number three. I will not answer on, on Singapore Stock Exchange because I don't understand the Singapore market. Uh, uh, and I can't, uh, you know, I can't answer that. On the shadow banking system, this is very interesting. The shadow banking system is a wonderful term invented by Paul McCulley of PIMCO, which the central bankers grabbed with great pleasure. Because there's an old Asian saying, those people who have ghosts think that there are ghosts everywhere, and the ghosts explain everything. So the central bankers and the regulators which allowed this to happen suddenly said, it's not my fault, it all happened in the shadow banking system. And the shadow banks are not regulated, which is not strictly speaking true, because 90% of the shadow banks are regulated. Okay? What these guys, the crisis happened not because they did not see it, because all the information was right in front of them, because they did not want to see it. It was a silo. Everybody is a specialist. This is outside my area, somebody else's problem. Central bankers said, this didn't happen under my watch, it's the financial regulator. Financial regulator, I cannot control interest rates, asset bubble, I cannot control, it's the central bank, right? And you know, everybody blame everybody else, and then of course, you know, that's what I, Philosophically, I am very angry at what Mr. Bernanke said. He said, my problem, which is I cannot control monetary policy, is because you Chinese, you, you, you Saudis, and you, you Germans, you save too much. Hello, you're running the world's, if equivalent of the world's central bank. You cannot, you cannot deny this. But strictly speaking, he is not wrong. It's my dollar, it's your problem. If you don't know how to manage your dollar that you are holding, why are you holding dollars? It's your problem. And so I think philosophically, he is also right. 
right? So I think, you know, the, what happens in the shadow banking? The shadow banking issue is that in China, they realized that the things went into the shadows because the official banking system did not satisfy the market need. And what did the market need? The poor saver who put everything in the banking system says, I need higher interest rates. And is it fair to ask for higher interest? Of course it's fair to ask for higher interest rates. The poor SME guy who has been borrowing at 10, 15, 12%, actually the SME doesn't care about the interest rate. I, I make a very controversial statement, but I, let me give you a simple example. In Indonesia, they invented the wet market business. What is the wet market business? The bank sends a van to the wet market, to the market in the morning, and said, anybody who wants one million rupiah, I'll lend it to you. At the end of the day, you, let, you give me back 1.1 million rupiah. That's 10% per day. <laughs> but there are people who are willing to borrow like this. Why? Because if I borrow a million rupiah, I can buy the chicken, I can buy the ducks, I can buy the vegetables, I can buy the fish, and I will be able to sell at 1.3 million rupiah, and I pay back 1.1 million, I still got 200,000 rupiah, which is actually not bad at all. Right? And I am not likely to default because actually I know that if tomorrow, when I need that money and you don't lend to me, I'm dead. Okay? So actually, the, it's not the interest rate that counts. Shadow banking is all these kind of non-conventional bank loans, right, at what appears to be usurious interest rates. It is actually satisfying a function in the market. So the P2P, you know, all this fundamental, of course there is fraud. But, you know, Harold Macmillan told me something when I was studying in the United Kingdom, which finally I understood. The British Empire was never intended by the British government. It was founded by British pirates. And actually, the shadow banking is like this. They go into areas which are, there are no law, there are no rules. They create something, something is right, something is wrong, and then government comes in to sort it out. If the government says everything, this you cannot do, that you cannot do, there will be no innovation, there will be no entrepreneurship. Right? So to a large extent, what the Chinese did with the shadow banking system is that the system is so large, you can allow some creativity. It is what in China is called the one eye shut, one eye open policy. <laughs> the regulator opens one eye and shuts one eye. And if, you, if the innovation happened, Alibaba could only have happened in China. Alibaba cannot happen anywhere else. Because what Alibaba, strictly speaking, did was to become a bank as well as a logistics company. And they married the same thing on the same platform. Okay? So the Chinese attitude towards innovation and you can say that the Chinese are also bureaucratic, which is not completely wrong because it's the oldest bureaucracy in the world, but they actually allowed that innovation to happen. And today, actually, they are still allowing that innovation even though it carries risk. Because they know that in crossing the river by feeding the stones, if it does not take the risk, the risk is even bigger afterwards. So I think, you know, I'm not saying that the Chinese are perfect. I'm not saying that they don't make mistakes. I'm not saying that what the mistakes that they have are big because they are very big and they are, have global implications. I'm saying that the macro conditions that I study, they are able to sort out their problems. Then it will be very bumpy, but I'm fairly confident they can manage their shadow banking issue because what I did from this was to study the national balance sheet. Now, even if you can say, oh, those numbers are problematic, but essentially, the big story is fairly clear. The Chinese are not an economy that borrows from somebody else in order to grow. That's how we got into the Asian financial crisis. The, my book in the Asian financial crisis predicted that any country, that the biggest single indicator from the Asian financial crisis, that any country had a net foreign liability, liability, not an asset, or 50% of GDP got into crisis. That's exactly what happened. Okay? Since then, Asians have learned from this, build up large foreign exchange reserves, use the flexible exchange rate to cushion themselves. So we are much better prepared for the next crisis. But will it happen? Will we make mistakes? Who knows? I can't predict that. 
So I think, um, sorry, we've, we've run out of time. So at this stage, I have to bring the, the, the evening's proceedings to a close. I'd like all of us to thank Andrew. I think it's been extremely educational in a very deep way. Thank you.